Okay, we're going to talk about the skeleton of the lower limb and answer the questions. What are the lower limb bones? What are their primary bony landmarks? And what are the major joints? Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Morton, and I'm the noted anatomist. So here are the different bones of the lower limb that we're going to cover. And I'm going to start with the pelvis and os coxa. Now, this one is going to be a little interesting because... I'm going to talk about the pelvis first because there's more than one bone, and then we'll go through each of the bones individually, ilium, ischium, and pubis. So let's start first with this pelvis, and these are the structures we're going to talk about. But before we do that, let's talk about some terminology. This term pelvic girdle means two pelvic bones and the sacrum and the pubic symphysis. So there it is, and there are the two pelvic bones and the sacrum and the symphysis pubic or pubic symphysis. Wonderful. But then we have this term pelvic bone, which is only one half of the pelvic girdle. There it is. And we also call it the os coxa, which is singular. And the old word that was used is the innominate bone. And then os coxae is plural for both of them together. Okay? Not confusing at all. Uh, to be honest, most of the time we end up using them all together. We shouldn't, but we often use them the same. Os coxa is formed by the fusion of three bones, our ilium, our ischium, and the pubic bone or pubis. And let's cover the landmarks associated with these three fused pelvic bones. All right. Um, there's a joint. It's between the sacrum and ilium, so appropriately called the sacroiliac joint or SI joint. It is a synovial plane joint. Next is this thing. It's called the acetabulum, which is Latin for vinegar cup because that's what early anatomists kind of thought it looked like. It's the socket for the head of the femur for this ball and socket synovial joint, the hip joint. All right, now we're going to turn so you can see a lateral view of this pelvic bone or the pelvis from the right side, and there's the acetabulum, and there's the ilium, ischium, and pubis. This is for an adult. This is for a newborn. That's the acetabulum, ilium, ischium, and pubis. Now notice the blue, there's this hyaline cartilage called the triradiate cartilage, okay? This is now showing an x-ray of a healthy, uh, the, a normal healthy pelvis of a four-year-old. And look at that. This is not a fracture, okay? This is actually the, the hyaline cartilage, these growth plates uh, for these three bones, ilium, ischium, and pubis, as this individual is growing. Cartilage does not show up on an x-ray. So that's acetabulum. Now this is a hole. So what do we call this hole? The obturator foramen because the word obturator is Latin to stop or to block up. It gets its name because the obturator foramen for the most part is blocked up by the obturator membrane. And at the very top is the obturator canal for the obturator nerve artery and vein going from the pelvic cavity into the medial compartment of the thigh. Here's a big notch. We call it the greater sciatic notch. And it gets its name greater sciatic notch because of the, because of the sciatic nerve traversing through it. This is the pelvic inlet, which is basically the top of the pelvis, this opening where the pubis and arcuate line and sacrum uh, meet. That's how structures from the abdomen get into the pelvis and vice versa. If we now look at an inferior view of the pelvis, this is called the pelvic outlet for it's the, the basically the opening between the pubis, the conjoint ramus, ischial tuberosity, and the coccyx bone. This is how we get things from the pelvic cavity to the outside. So this is where the urethra, vagina, anus, and so forth are located. Let's now do each individual bone, starting with the ilium and doing those bony landmarks. And so here is a medial view of the pelvis on the right side. There in the peach color is the ilium. And there we have a crest or a ridge. And here we have a shallow depression. So when we take a look at this crest or ridge, we're going to call this the iliac crest. There it is. And this shallow depression, we use the word fossa. So let's call this the iliac fossa, where the iliacus muscle arises. Let's now turn around and look at a lateral view of this pelvis from the right side. And so this is now showing the anterior surface and the posterior, anterior, posterior surface. The ilium has four spines. I should read it. There are four spines on the ilium. One, two, three, and four. So if you're an anatomist having to name this spine that's on the front of the ilium and it's above the other one, we call it the anterior superior iliac spine or ASIS, where the sartorius attaches. This one appropriately then is the anterior 
inferior iliac spine where the rectus femoris attaches. This then is on the back, so we call this the posterior superior iliac spine where that little dimple is on the top of your backside. And then there is our posterior inferior iliac spine. Okay, ASIS, attachment for the sartorius, AIIS for the rectus femoris, and then if we look on the back, there's that cute little dimple. Okay, shing, there. Next is the ischium. Now, the ischium has the following four landmarks, and so there's our ischium bone, and there is a spiky projection, and there's a bump or a swelling, and there's a branch. So, for the spiky projection, we often use the word spine. So, what do we call this? the ischial spine. And what word do we use for bumper swelling? Tuberosity. Ischial tuberosity. And what word do we use for branch? Ramus. Ischial ramus. And there's our three structures. So there's the ischial spine. Above it is the greater sciatic notch and below it is the lesser sciatic notch. The greater, uh, the ischial tuberosity is an attachment for our hamstring muscles, biceps femoris, semitendinosus, and membranosus. It's awesome. Next is our pubis. All right, now the pubis has the following landmarks that we're going to cover. And so there's a branch, and there's another branch, and there's a bumper swelling. So what do we call this branch here? We'll call it a pubic ramus, but there's also another one below it. So we'll call this one the superior pubic ramus, and this one the inferior pubic ramus. And then the inferior pubic ramus, then there, it, it, it actually smoothly transitions into the ischial ramus. So anatomists take these two and often call it the ischiopubic ramus or conjoint ramus. As you can see from those colors, there really isn't a line. It's more like this, but we know you can see usually a little notch where they join. And then the bumper swelling is the pubic tubercle. Okay. All right. Now, um, there, and then we've already talked about the pubic symphysis, that wedge of fibral cartilage that connects the two pubic bones. All right, femur is next. And the femur is the principal bone of the thigh. And here, you, and uh, it's actually Latin for thigh. And here are all the landmarks we're going to cover. Here's an anterior and posterior view of the right femur. And this dome-shaped thing at the top, we appropriately call the head of the femur. And that head of the femur is a ball that articulates in the socket, the acetabulum, to form the synovial hip joint. There's this divot on the uh, medial surface of the head of the femur called the fovea capitis that attaches the ligamentum teres, also called the round ligament of the femur. This is appropriately called the neck because it's below the head and it forms a de about 125 degree angle the neck of the femur does to the shaft of the femur. Okay, well, that was rude. I just yawned. Look at that. I'm sorry. Here's this really big bony landmark that we call the greater trochanter that you can see on the front and on the back. Lots of muscles attached to it. You've got the gluteus maximus. I call it, pardon me, the gluteus medius and minimus. You've also got a number of the um, deep hip rotators attached to that huge uh, greater trochanter. Now, the smaller one is called the lesser trochanter that you can see from the front and from the back. And this is an attachment site for the iliopsoas muscles. So the psoas major and, and the iliacus, once they cross below the inguinal ligament there in green, that forms the iliopsoas muscle that inserts on the lesser trochanter. Big, big hip flexor. This now has a line that goes between the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter. So we'll call it the intertrochanteric line. And it's an attachment for the joint capsule uh, that connects the proximal part of the femur to the, uh, around the acetabulum. On the back, on the posterior surface between the greater and lesser trochanter is a crest. Call it the intertrochanteric crest. Lots of muscles attached to it. Okay, here's a bump or swelling, and the gluteus maximus attaches to it. So that's the gluteal tuberosity that looks much better in a real bone. Then on the back of the femur is this line. It's a rough line, so we call it the linea aspera, and it's lots of muscles attached to it. And there you can see it even more prominently on this real bone, like our uh, adductor brevis longus and part of the magnus, the vastus medialis and lateralis, and the short head of the biceps femoris, all attached to that linea aspera, okay? Well, there's all the attachments there. All right, now, uh, here we have 
the medial condyle and there's the lateral condyle that articulate with the tibia. And uh, between the two is called the intercondylar notch. Now that's important because in the intercondylar notch, we have the attachments of the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments or ACL and PCL. If we now take a look there, there is a bumper swelling that the adductor magnus attaches to. So we call it the adductor tubercle. Here, I did it again. I'm really sorry, you guys. I didn't get enough sleep last night. In green, there's the adductor magnus. Now, notice that part of the adductor magnus is attaching posteriorly to the linea aspera, but part of it goes to the adductor tubercle. And notice that opening. We call it the adductor hiatus. Now, why do we care about the adductor hiatus? Well, the femoral artery that's descending in the anterior compartment of the thigh traverses and goes through this adductor hiatus and enters the back of the knee in the popliteal fossa and now changes its name to popliteal artery. So the adductor hiatus is how the femoral artery goes from the anterior compartment of the thigh to the back of the knee. Okay, we call this one the medial epicondyle because it's above the medial condyle. And its attachment part for the medial collateral ligament because it goes to the medial epicondyle, but it's also called the tibial collateral ligament because it arises from the tibia. Now, the other side is appropriately called the lateral epicondyle that attaches an attachment part for the lateral collateral ligament because it goes from the lateral epicondyle, but it's also called the fibular collateral ligament because it attaches to the fibula bone. And finally, on the distal anterior surface of the femur is the patellar surface because it articulates the patellar bone, which is the largest sesamoid bone in the body. And that's basically where the quadriceps femoris tendon engulfs in before going to the tibial tuberosity. Okay. Next is the tibia and fibula. We'll do each of these individually. So first, the tibia is the principal bone of the leg. There's our tibia. And it's Latin for shin bone. Let's talk about each of these structures on the tibia. First are these two, basically, condyles. So we call this one the lateral condyle on the fibula side and the medial condyle on the medial side. Okay, And they then, you take the two tibial condyles they articulate with the femoral condyles, and that's what makes this synovial bicondylar joint that functions much like a hinge joint for flexion and extension. Between the two is this eminence. So we call it the intercondylar eminence, and it's important because that's how our ACL and PCL anchor to the top of the tibia is via the intercondylar eminence. ACL on the front, PCL on the back. We now have this big bumper swelling on the front of the tibia. We appropriately call it the tibial tuberosity. It's really a, prime, a primary bony landmark because the quadriceps femoris tendons engulf the patella as a sesamoid bone and then become the patellar ligament that attaches and anchors to the tibial tuberosity. In surface anatomy, it looks like that. We have the interosseous border that attaches the interosseous membrane anchoring the tibia and fibula together, okay? And on the medial surface of the distal tibia is the medial malleolus, which is Latin for hammer. That's what the medial malleolus looks like in surface anatomy, okay? Now, the fibula is the lateral bone of the leg, and there's all the structures we're going to talk about, and I think of this as fibulateral, okay? But fibula is Latin for brooch, but we look at this word peronius, which is Greek for brooch. What the what? So we look at one of these old brooches. They use the word fibula or peronius for this part on the side, which means brooch. So fibula and peronius mean the exact same things. One Latin, one's Greek. Very frustrating because we call it the fibula bone, but a lot of times we use the word peronius for the muscles. They're the same thing. Okay, the very proximal top, and it's the very top and it's dome-shaped, we call it the fibula head. The fibula head um, has an attachment for our bi long head of the biceps femoris muscle. Below the head is the neck. And the neck is important because that's where the common peroneal nerve wraps around the neck of the fibula to enter the, um, then divide into the uh, uh, superficial and deep peroneal nerves. 
right around the neck. All right. Here's the other interosseous border for the interosseous membrane anchoring the tibia and fibula together. Something else this interosseous membrane does is it separates the anterior from posterior compartments of the leg. All right. If we have a medial malleolus, we have a lateral malleolus as well that in surface anatomy looks like that. Okay. The pronius longus and brevis muscle tendons descend and then course posteriorly and inferior to, these, to this lateral malleolus. All right, finally is the foot and the foot bones. Let's talk about the principal bones of the foot that we have tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. Let's start with the tarsals, uh, which is Latin for ankle, and there's seven tarsal bones. The first is the talus. The talus is means Latin for small, a slope or small hill. And there it is in green is the talus, but there's the lateral and medial malleolus, and then look at, there's this joint between them, like that. It's called a mortis joint. This Well, the tibio-talar joint because of the articulations between the tibia, distal tibia, and the top of the talus. But it's a mortis joint that fits together like this. This is what allows dorsiflexion and plantar flexion movements. Dorsiflexion, walking on your heels. Plantar flexion, walking on your toes. Okay, next is the calcaneus, which is Latin for heel bone. And it looks like there's the calcaneus there. Okay, we zoom in and find the calcaneus that then has an attachment for the calcaneal tendon for the gastroc and soleus muscles, but also the flexor retinaculum that courses between the medial malleolus and the calcaneus. And through that flexor retinaculum is a, is a tarsal tunnel. And that's where the posterior tibial artery and vein and tibial nerve enter the plantar surface of the foot. There's also the plantar aponeurosis that attaches to the um, calcaneus bone. Here we have in this illustration that plantar aponeurosis, very, very dense regular connective tissue. The subtalar joint, as its name implies, is below the talus. There's the talus in green, and there's the calcaneus in orange. It's the joint below the talus. It's what allows, or it's also called the talocalcaneal joint. It is what allows for inversion and eversion motions of your ankle to appear. Okay, the navicular bone is the, the next one, and it's Latin for boat because if we see there in green and we turn it like this, we can say, yeah, I can see that's a boat, uh, and that's Latin. But if you remember, scaphoid for the wrist is, la is Greek for boat as well. I guess anatomists love boats. Okay, then we have the cuneiform bones. It gets their name for its Latin for wedge-shaped, and there's a medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiform bone. They're the most distal of our tarsal bones. And finally, there's the cuboid. Okay, the cuboid gets its name because that's Greek for cube-shaped. There are the seven tarsal bones. We're now going to go distal to that, to the metatarsals, because that prefix meta is Latin for after, and tarsals is ankle. These are the bones after the ankle. And there are five metatarsal bones. The number one is medial, and number five is lateral. Number one articulates with the great toe. Distally, we call it the head. Proximally, we call it the base. Okay? Then the phalanges. Here we have the first phalange is the hallux, and which is Latin for great toe. And then we have digits two, three, four, and five, and the little baby toe is most lateral. We take these digits two through five, and we call them the lesser toes. That's not a complex at all. So there we have the great toe, which has a proximal and distal phalanx, and then the lesser toes have a proximal, middle, and distal phalanx. Okay? That, my friends, is the skeleton of the lower limb in a nutshell.